All right. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Upper Room Fellowship of Jesus Christ Campus, campus Study number 21, or is it 22? Uh, all right. Anyway, well, we, we are definitely in a new subject. So uh, before we begin, let me give it all to the Lord. I think it's 22. Well, Heavenly Father, in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you and praise you for your, the gift of your word and giving us this opportunity to gather uh, both live now and make this available to others in the future. We ask you to be the one in total control uh, of the word that goes forth, prepare our hearts and minds to receive your truth and have your way in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, I believe that's uh, incorrect. It's uh, study number 22, but uh, we will move on. The title of this sermon, which is what matters, of this study is the Sermon on the Mount, part three. The Sermon on the Mount is found in the book of Matthew, uh, chapters five, six, and seven. We've covered chapters five and six. We are on the seventh and uh, chapter seven, the third and final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're going to just quickly go over what we touched on last week. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So this is the beginning of the concept of do we, are we here to please man or please God? When we do things and we show off and people say, oh, how great a person you are, then there is nothing from God because we're looking to get our recognition from man. But when we do our good deeds or when we do our prayers or anything else, it's really all about our relationship with God. Um, there we go. Verse six, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now today, I guess it's still possible even in the church to be a, a prayer warrior just doing it so people can see us doing it. But really, it's about our relationship with the Lord. We have prayer meetings where we go corporate prayer, and we're all in the same heart to just seek God and have him touch our lives. Then he gave us the model prayer in verses 9 through, I think it's 12, but I just covered the first two here. In this manner, therefore, Pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's about how we approach how we approach God to understand that He is not just our buddy down the street. Uh, he is truly uh, there to be revered and honored. He deserves it, and uh, so when we come to Him, we come to Him in that that position of humility and reverence. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reality is, if God's will is what, well, if we want God's will, we want the best. Because God's will is always a blessing. It's always win-win. It's, it's the best possible thing. Anytime we want anything outside of his will, and we're going to cover more of this later, it's generally not going to work out as well as if we just live for his will. Living for God's will is, is our desire. Um, and then we covered, we, we talked about forgiveness, and we also jumped over to Matthew 18, and we'll just take verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And of course, that's not a literal 490 times. And after that, 491 times, you don't have to forgive. I believe what he's saying is that there's no limit to um, forgiveness because there is no limit to God's forgiveness for us as well. Praise the Lord. And then talks about where our our treasure is in uh, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither, neither 
moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't know if it's here, but basically, if our, we're looking to money and material things to save us, we're not looking to God to save us. It's one or the other. When we seek first God, uh, he takes care of our physical needs on this earth. Amen. Then he jumps over on verses 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Uh, where would I, I be good? In seeking God and learning to, about him through his word and being in fellowship and so forth. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, or, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? When we're focusing on the things of this world, especially the things of darkness, you've heard of the dark web, it's all stuff that's not good, but really all the things that the world has to offer in the sense of uh, pleasing the flesh is darkness. It's a way, it's not the light, it's darkness. And so if we focus on those things, our lamps go out, we're not shining his light, we're just shining darkness. We're not even shining. Uh, then we get to verses 31 through 33. And therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things Gentiles or the world seeks, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And that's the bottom line. We pursue God. We want to get to know him better. We want to know what his will is for our lives. We don't have to worry about our finances, our family, a roof over our head, all a job, all those things. God takes care of that when we focus on him. Praise the Lord. Okay, before we get into today, chapter 7, anyone have any questions, comments about last week's teaching? Okay, then, praise the Lord. Then we'll move on with chapter 7. Pick it up in verse 1. And what does Jesus tell us today? Judge not that you be not judged. And what I said last week that forgiveness was a very important um, aspect of our walk with Christ. He wants us to forgive. He also does not want us to judge. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrites, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I believe when we talk about that, when we see clearly, we see differently. We don't see what we see in the, in the natural and we judge people. What would happen is once he has our, the plank taken out of our eyes and we can see, we see spiritually and we speak God's word and we see with God's eyes. And when we now, when we remove the speck, it's not with judgment, it's with prayer and, and love and counseling and those kind of things. We let God do it through us instead of us deciding what a person needs to be fixed of because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Judgment is very, very uh, important that God doesn't want us to do that. Let the judgment happen. Let him do all judging. James 4, verses 11 and 12, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Amen. He really didn't like that judging. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge one another? Amen. And that lawgiver is God himself. And he's able to save or to destroy. Praise the Lord. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty 
of all. This is extremely important for us to understand. In my life before God called me, I was keeping score, do more good things and less bad things, and I was doing good. A lot of people even told me that you're you know, you're you're a good guy and all that kind of stuff. I thought ah, I must be around a nine point five. And then I found out the passing grade was a hundred, or maybe a million. There was no way that I could meet all the God's expectations, nor could anyone else. And so, if we stumble at one piece of the law, we're as guilty as a as a murderer, or um, everybody that we can think of, we're all guilty. We're all guilty. For he who said, "Do not commit adultery," also said, "Do not murder." Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, and we learned that murder isn't just about physically killing someone, but being angry with a person or just speaking bad about them, you become a transgressor of the law. So no one can boast. No one can boast. Romans 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge one another, or judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Now hold on, this person's got a bunch of rings in their nose and tattoos, and I don't have any of that. But it doesn't matter. We we are guilty just like everyone else. And as a matter of fact, I think we're harder on people that are that amplify our own faults than anyone else. Um, and I've seen that through much experience that we tend to really get down on people who are who ex- uh, exhibit our own weaknesses. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God? Amen. So this is a very important uh, subject, and I want to know before we go on to the next thing, uh, we'll actually be look at God's nature. Are there any questions about anything I just covered when it comes to judging people? Now, if we think that we can just stop on our own, uh, there's just no way. We need God's help here. I know for sure that I judge people when I see them. I size them up because the world told me to do that. And it makes my flesh feel better. But the truth is now, knowing the word, I ask God to help me and convict me when I'm judging someone else so that I don't do that because I want to reflect God's nature. That's why I don't want to judge. He doesn't want us to do that. This is what God's nature is like in his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. So this is not an accusation. They caught her in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. So think of today, some law that people are breaking, and we catch them in the act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Now they're asking Jesus. They're trying to, as we're going to see, trap him. Now they've already seen how merciful and compassionate he is, and now they got the law, they got a woman caught in adultery, and they want to know what he's going to say. This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Hmm. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even from the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. 
God has the exact perfect word to get us, stop us in our tracks when we're walking in our pride and thinking we got it together. He has a way of showing us we don't. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? He said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, God said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. This is God's heart. God convicts us, conviction of the Holy Spirit, just like he convicted those people who were ready to stone her, ready to judge her. But then he showed them, he let them see that if they stone her, they all need to be stoned as well. Because if you've broken one law, you've broken them all. And all have broken the law and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one perfect walking on this planet today. Amen. And so this is God's heart. He'd rather convict people and have them turn from their sinful ways so they do not be judged and not perish. Praise the Lord. Any question about that? Comment, Revelation. Okay, we go on. That was the big important one right there. Now we go to verse 6 of Matthew 7. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Amen. Now this can be a little complicated or a little difficult to understand. Uh, there are a lot of different things that we can talk about here. Uh, one thing is that God gives us spiritual wisdom and knowledge, and if we're just passing it out to just anyone, uh, it could just turn right against us because they're not following Christ. They're not, they don't have the fear of the Lord, and they'll use anything we say to try to get us in trouble and so forth. But there's another aspect of this that I thought that I needed to focus on today. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 7 and 8 says, he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Amen. So what does this mean, and how does this uh, tie to casting pearls before swine or giving something holy to the dogs? And what I believe God is telling us today is that it's very easy to get pretty excited and talk about the things of God and wanting people to turn to God, and we do it on our own strength. And the truth is, if God hasn't prepared someone's heart to come to him, no one comes to him unless the Father draw him, then all that you get is flesh. And when we start telling people, it goes back to judgment, repent, you sinner, because you're... You, you, because of your foul language or because of your drinking or your drug use or because of your sexual preference or whatever the case, and we judge them and we say these things, it's just going to hurt us because if God is not the one leading this, it's just like uh, there's a story in the Old Testament about the children of Israel. They just had a massive victory when they went and defeated Jericho because God told them what to do. They saw a little small town, and they said, ah, this is easy picking, but God didn't tell them to go, and they got defeated. If we think that, oh, my goodness, this is the truth, and now I'm going to stand on the street corner and tell everybody they need to repent and be saved, and it's not led by God, it's going to turn on us, and they're going to trample us. And we're going to learn that we must be led by the Spirit of God. God will get us in front of people that he's preparing their hearts and minds to receive the truth. But it must be God's work and not ours. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, rebuke a wise man means somebody who has the fear of the Lord. Or fear of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Someone that God has put us in front of and given his word through us. That's when someone said, oh, thank you for that word. I appreciate it. I repent and I get prayer because they fear the Lord and they want to get better. Praise the Lord. Any questions, comments about this, this difficult subject here? Okay, we move on. 
And now we get to verse 7, 7 through 11. And this is another very good foundational truth for everyone. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, does that mean we're asking for a yacht and a happy retirement program? Is that we're going to we're going to know more about that in a little bit. It, it's really about seeking God's will for our lives and needing those things. And I'll just break right here. God has told me to tell people uh, that are that are not walking with God not to say, "Hey, here's the answer, and you must listen to me in this word." But God actually has me saying, "If you are willing to know the truth and willing to humble yourself, just ask." And God will answer. God will reveal himself. And how do I know that? Not only did God tell me to say it, but on my own testimony, I didn't know what the truth was. I was struggling. I was in a bad place. I had seen, heard about Christianity along with Buddhism and all kinds of things, including aliens from outer space. And I couldn't find the truth on my own strength. And one day I just looked up and screamed, Whoever, whatever you are, just please reveal yourself. Give me the truth. And he answered, and that's why I'm here giving you this word today. I didn't know who or what, anything. But I, God heard my cry and answered my prayer. If you don't know what the truth is yet, and you're confused, and you're willing to humble yourself, just look up and ask, what's the truth? Give me the truth. Lead me to the truth. What is my purpose in life? And he will answer you if you want the truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. So there it is. Uh, now, what does that mean? Well, we, we may not... We may think, oh, I don't want to be a, lead a stuffy life. If we don't really know him, then we don't understand that his will is the perfect father who wants he, all of us to be blessed. The plans, I know the plans I have for you, plans for you to have a beautiful life and prosper. That's what he wants. He wants his children to have a wonderful life. And if we understand that, then we submit to his will. But many times our flesh thinks we know better and we go against his will. Sometimes he'll even answer a prayer just to let us learn a lesson. Uh, so, so it's just best to ask for his will. And if we know that he hears us, whenever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked him. Praise the Lord. Just a confirmation that he, he is just waiting for us to ask. He doesn't force himself on anyone, but he just wants us to to acknowledge him and ask, and he'll give it to us, especially if we want his will for our lives. It's the way, it is the way, praise the Lord. All right, any questions about that? We're gonna give an example here of someone who, uh, who, had, who had a big ask and got it, and that's the son of King David, King Solomon. David had just passed away and now King Solomon is taking over, and we pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 13. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? There's that father who really wants to bless his children. And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in an uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, 
but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Now, this doesn't mean he was a tiny little kid, but he understood knowing the ways of God. He didn't know much, and he humbled himself before God right here and, and was honest that he didn't know much. And see the humility of this request right here. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too number, numerous to be numbered or counted. And now all of a sudden he's king. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, not the way we're talking about with the flesh, but God's type of judgment. That I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. Amen. So this is a judge in those days is somebody who God has appointed and God is the one who reveals to them what, what's going on. And then, then they, they, they um, execute that judgment or whatever the case, but they're not doing it from their own resources. So he asked God for an understanding heart to really discern between good and evil the way God does. This speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. You see how God wants us to ask for things. It pleased God. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, something we don't naturally want to do, nor asked riches for yourself, another thing our flesh would want to do, nor have asked the life of your enemies, you see God's heart for everyone, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your word. God answered him and gave him that. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be not any... There shall not be any one like you among the kings all your days. Amen. And it became true. Not only did God give him the wisdom that no one had ever seen before on this planet, but also he was filthy rich and all that, but that wasn't his focus. Neither was it Abraham's focus. They all sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things were given to them. But their focus was on God in God's will for their lives. Praise the Lord. If that's our prayer request, it pleases God and uh, and he answers it. Praise the Lord. Any questions, comments, or concerns about any of that? Praise the Lord. Back to the sermon. Uh, verse 12, chapter seven, verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, you also to them, for this is the law and the prophet. Amen. And this is the common teaching. Uh, some people call it the golden rule. Treat others the way you want, but want to be treated. And that does come from God as well. If you want to be treated a certain way, treat others the way you want to be treated. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says, These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. In other words, well, if we ever got in a situation, we would want all truth to be told, we would want justice to be held, and we would want peace for ourselves and everyone around us. That's what we want. And God is saying, do this to the people around you. But none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. Notice it doesn't say only if they're nice. It says, let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor and do not love a false oath. For all these things are things that I hate, says the Lord. Amen. So really treating each other with love and kindness is what God wants because that's how he feels for all of us as well. When he sees people doing bad things, he knows they're being influenced by works of darkness and he wants to redeem them. He wants them to turn and come to the truth because he loves them. Praise the Lord. Many people come to the Lord when they're in prison uh, because they already paid a price for their crimes and now they have quality time to think about it. And many people ultimately find God there 
when they realize what's happened. And God loves them and he redeems them. Praise the Lord. All right. Shifting gears here, I just want to confess some of the words that we're about to, to go through are the words that God spoke to me to bring me to repentance and salvation. Very powerful words coming here right now. The narrow way. Verses 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Remember the word many. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Few. All right, let's look at that again. So there's a narrow gate, a difficult way, and then there's this wide gate and broad way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. Uh, you got the, was it Thoreau, somebody? Two, do, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled, and that's made all the difference, something like that. The one less traveled, the one that's Difficult because it requires letting go of our control of our lives because we were never intended to be in control of our lives. Uh, but the world and the devil has told us we need to be. But God wants us to be little children sitting at his feet and let him be in control. And then we'll grow and have a blessed life. And so that narrow way is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Man. And we think on just on our own rationalization, our own thinking about, oh, this is the right way to go. It's the way of death. The way is to humble ourselves before our creator and ask him to show us the way, the difficult, narrow way that leads to life. We're never going to find it on our own strength. It's going to be by just dropping to our knees or whatever, humbling ourselves and letting the one that created us show us the way. Amen. Any questions, comments about this topic? Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 25, this is the narrow way. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If we see in ourselves our own sinfulness and we can't stand what we see in ourselves, we, we, and we try all kinds of things and it's all miserable, and we're willing to lay down the way we live our life and ask him to take over, that's where we find eternal life. That is the narrow way. Praise the Lord. Psalm 116, verse 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, at first look, this sounds sounds like somebody who put straps of bombs of, bombs of themselves and all that kind of stuff. That is not what this is talking about. Death to self, death to our way and letting go. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What does that mean? He wants to replace our head and our thoughts of what we think we should be doing with our lives with his. And let him be Lord of our lives. Let him order our steps. That's dying the self. When we let go and let him take over, that's the death of ourselves. Letting go. That's why John the Baptist said in John chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's the way to life. Is to, now, how do we do that if we don't know him? The more we get to know him, the more you're on these studies and sermons and speaking God on your own with the word, the more we get to know him, more, the more we trust him. And then we are, it's much easier for us to let go and let him be in control. To let go and let God, as they say. We must know him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. So if we don't have the faith, all we have to do is say, Lord, I believe, help my own belief. Your word says you're the author and finisher of my faith. So I ask you to give me the faith. 
and he'll do it. Remember, ask and he will. He wants us to have faith, so it's a good request. Praise the Lord. All right. Any questions about any of that? Or revelation? Okay. We go on with the sermon, and the next part is who do we follow? Because in verse 15 through 20, he says to us, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree, people can be referred to as trees, bears good fruit. And what does fruit mean? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Um, I forgot the rest. I'm sure Pastor and I can help. But uh, we, uh, all the good things, when, when, when somebody is bearing that fruit, that's a tree we should be eating from. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. Somebody is always asking for money before he gives you a prophecy or money for prayer or anything like that. Ten, that's not God's way. And so we can see that. But the safest way to know where to go, let me finish this. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Amen. Praise the Lord. So who do we follow? That was the question. How do we know who we should be feeding from, who we should be following? Uh, I can tell you now that God is not in the, ha in the habit of making everybody go solo. It's not God's ways. He keep, puts us around people. And he still shows us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. Amen. So he has created these people, uh, elders, to with different giftings, that they would all come together and they would be there to help people on their way. You're on this study today because of this. So how do we determine who we should be spending time with? The answer is ask God. Because he has a place for each and every one of you. And when we ask him, he will show us. Keep us from someone that's going to hurt us or make us go astray. And plant me with the people that you're going to use to feed me what I need to grow, to get to know you and be stronger and live a life pleasing to you. And he'll answer because it's a good request. It's his will. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, and that, that brings us to God's will. But any questions about that? We don't have to get smart and try to figure it out. Say, I should go here because of this or that. There's no perfect people, even those apostles and, 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 and uh, prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers are fallen people who have issues. We're not to judge them and say, well, that person did this, so I'm not supposed to be here. Where we are to ask God where He wants us, leaning not on our un, on our own understanding, but in always acknowledging Him, and He will order our steps, and it will be the best path for us, even if it doesn't seem like it. And I can testify to that. Surrendering to God's will is the answer. Amen. Praise the Lord. And there we go. Verses 21 through 23. Not everyone. This is Jesus talking to us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. What? But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The key to this walk is doing God's will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Those are spiritual gifts that, that God gives his children. All who come into this kingdom, he gives these, or all who he redeems, he gives gifts. 
And so we can be out there using the gifts and casting out demons and healing the sick and doing all that stuff. But if we're doing it on our own, we're not doing God's will. We are meant to be his body parts, his hands, his feet, his lips. He is the one who needs to do it. And if we are doing our own will, we're not doing his will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Oh, I know how this ministry is going to get a lot of people in the church and all that stuff. If it's our idea, it's not going to work. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness in the spirit even, because it is, we are here to walk and follow God's leading to do his will, to be his hands and feet. That way he is glorified and we are blessed because of it. Otherwise, we may take credit for ourselves trying to do all these things and saying we got X number of people in the kingdom. But the truth is, unless God does it, it's not going to come to anything. And ultimately, God will reveal it. So doing the will of God is extremely, extremely important. That is what we live for. And the best way is to Come before him and say, lead me. And when we let him take control, everything's going to be fine. I've witnessed many people who, who were doing that, but they still, with some part of their life, they didn't want to let go of some plan they had, some person they wanted to be with, whatever it was. And I saw them go astray because they didn't stay in God's will. And they suffered because of it. But God is faithful. He can bring them back. Praise the Lord. Any questions, comments, or any revelation about doing God's will. All right, we're getting to the end of the sermon then. Here we go. Verses 24 through 29. Therefore, this is Jesus talking. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. Amen. The rock is the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ himself. When we found everything on him, when we do his will, when we have him take over, we put our trust in him. Maybe you've seen a, a brother or a sister who it doesn't seem like anything phases them. It doesn't matter what the economy, the weather, the health, sickness, whatever the case, it doesn't matter. They're at peace. It's because they're putting all their trust in Jesus and not themselves. But if we don't do that, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When the economy starts falling apart, when all those things we put our trust in stop working, everything falls apart, and we didn't put our trust in God, our health fails, and we come to the end of time, our time here on this earth, and we didn't put our trust in him, great is its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as his scribe. The religious leaders who had a pattern and they read the words and they had all their written theology and all this stuff, but it was in the power of the Spirit, Jesus was able to walk in that and speak God's word because God, the Father, was speaking through him. And that's what God wants us to be, is the next hands and feet on this earth, to see many more people saved from themselves and all works of darkness in this world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anyone have any questions, comments, or revelations over anything I covered today? All right. Well, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for this uh, wonderful word you've given us. No man can make up these things. These words came from you, and no one can argue with them. No one can fight them because it's truth. It's pure truth. And your word tells us that we'll hear the truth and the truth will set us free. I pray that you water every seed planted in every heart that has received these words today and that you cause it to flourish and 
raise up an army that will defeat the devil and all of his workers of iniquity and see many souls come into your kingdom that we can all celebrate together forever in your presence. We thank you for your amazing love for all of us. Show us the way in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For everyone here, for everyone listening in the future, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Amen.